Good afternoon and happy Sabbath to one and all. Happy Sabbath, Pastor. I pray that each and every one of you are well to this morning and I pray that you've had a good week. But even if you haven't, remember that God is there. God will take care of us. Sometimes we say to people, you need to smile more. But what I would say is that we need to be authentic and we need to trust in God more. I would just like to thank everyone who has been involved this morning um, from all of our, the people who have been up front, all the announcers, those who told the children's story as well. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing. But I'd like to just say thank you to those behind the scenes. Thank you to those who are on the AV because without them, we wouldn't be even able to be on this platform. So thank you as well. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath to one and all. This week has been a good week for some and a challenging week for others. It's been a challenging week because there have been bereavements and people have know that they have family members who are suffering and hurting at this particular point in time. Let's be mindful of those things as well. There's been things going on in the news. We've heard about Israel and Palestine and what is happening there. And that tells me something, something that we need to bear in mind that we've been told that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. One thing needs to happen and that's the gospel of the kingdom needs to pre be preached to all the world as a witness and then the end shall come. The end is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon and that we should be grateful for. There are going to be challenging times between now and then, but let's trust in Jesus, because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I would like to thank um, the individuals who pulled together the presentation for the small groups. Small groups are an incredible thing, and I just challenge you, if you're not a part of a small group, to, to think about it and maybe even email to get more information about it. I'm sure the email will be put up again. Email just to find out what what happens in a small group, how you can be involved in a small group and how that intimacy and fellowship and community can be developed. So that's my challenge for everyone who's not involved in a small group. You don't know what's gonna happen, but you don't know until you try. Just try, just try. Once again, thank you for being here on this Sabbath day and let's bow our heads and pray before we get into the message. Let's pray together. Father God, this is your time. Be with us in a special way. And I pray that your will is done, that your spirit will be showered upon us and that your name will be lifted up. Leave me behind the cross. Let your words be spoken. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had to wait? for something exciting. I think many of us have been in that position where we've had to wait for something exciting. Maybe a few days before that wedding day, we had butterflies in our stomach because we were waiting for something exciting. And maybe you say, well, my wedding was five, 10 or 15 years ago, but maybe it's a special anniversary that you're looking forward to or a special birthday that you're looking forward to. Have you ever had to wait for something exciting? During COVID times when we can't meet each other, maybe you have been someone who has been, uh, let's say, I don't wanna say addicted, but we have enjoyed shopping online. And maybe we're waiting for that new computer that we have ordered, waiting for something exciting or something special. Or maybe the exciting thing that we are waiting for is lockdown to be over. Waiting can be exciting. In some cases, as we have just highlighted, waiting for something can be good. But waiting can also seem terrible. Waiting for that medical result. Maybe that is a negative thing. 
or maybe waiting for a punishment that is coming your way. That could be a negative thing. You know, when I was a child and I misbehaved in church, my mom, she would just look at me to make me behave. Now, most of the time that would work. Now, if it didn't work and I continued to misbehave, all she had to do was whisper in my ear, wait till you get home. Now, at that point, I knew that I was in trouble. And at times like this, I didn't look forward to going home because I knew that something negative, in fact, I knew that something painful was waiting for me there. Sometimes we wait for something we do not look forward to. Now, waiting can be something good or it can be something bad, but it just depends on what we are waiting for. However, sometimes we get things confused. Sometimes we think that some things are good when they're actually bad, and some things are bad when they are actually good. I remember being about, well, primary school age, seven, eight, nine, something like that. And I was supposed to be going on a day trip with my school and my school friends. Now, I thought I was looking forward to the trip, but on the morning of the trip, I didn't feel well. I couldn't eat my breakfast my, because my stomach was churning. In fact, I just felt ill. But I couldn't be ill on this day. This is something that I'd been looking forward to. How could I be ill? I just felt terrible in my stomach. After much thinking, after much deliberation, I decided to tell my mom that it didn't feel well. I thought she would. I didn't feel well. I thought she would cancel the trip on my behalf. So I went to her and said, mom, I don't feel well. And my mom, who was a nurse at the time, she gave me a diagnosis. She said, I know you don't feel well, son, but the fact is you are excited. What you need to do is you need to go on the trip and enjoy it. Nothing bad is going to happen. In fact, something good is happening right now. So I looked at her with a, with a puzzled look. I didn't feel well, but I trusted her and I went on the trip and I enjoyed it. But that morning, that particular morning, it was like my body was confused. What was good, even exciting, my body thought was bad. I thought of as bad. Now, can this happen in our spiritual lives too? Now today I'm going to be looking at talking about a character, King David, who is many people's favorite Bible character. What do we know about David? Well, David was the youngest of his brothers and he was a shepherd. Now we often today maybe think of shepherding as a gentle profession. Oh, all the, all the shepherds are doing is looking after these cute cloud-like sheep. But David, the shepherd, had to protect his flock from lions and bears. It was not a gentle profession. It was, in fact, a dangerous profession. And as such, David had to be a responsible and brave young man. So in his case, David was actually a manly man. You know, if David was from anywhere in the UK, he would have been from Yorkshire. That's the kind of man David was. As he grew, we learn more about David. We, found, we find out that David is an accomplished warrior. He, he is a manly man. And not only is he an accomplished and accomplished warrior, he is an, an inspirational leader of people. David is a brave man, a warrior, a leader. He is a manly man. Now, even though David was a so-called manly man, whatever that means, there was actually another side to him. There was a different side to him. Because David, this manly man, 
was actually a man after God's own heart who had a softer side. Now, David, he had an expressive side. He is the one who wrote the majority of the Psalms. Now, sometimes people think that there is no softness in manliness, but there is. Have you ever seen a male lion playing with his cubs? Perhaps you have on a documentary. Is he soft and affectionate with the cubs that are around him? Yes, he is. But would you go and antagonize that lion? I don't think you would. There is softness in this so-called manliness. And David, this manly man, he is the one that wrote the majority of the Psalms. Now, if you read the Psalms, you can see that the, passenger, the passages are very personal to the writer. They tell of the writer's experience with God. But these personal experiences were also sung during temple worship. This means the Psalms not only meant something to the writer, but they were supposed to mean something to the congregation as well. In short, the Psalms were the personal experiences of an individual that a congregation of people could relate to. In other words, if the, the congregation were singing the song, they could say, this is my experience too. Not only do the Psalms, though, speak about our experience with God during many different times in our lives, but the Psalms were, were and are extremely poetic. For instance, Psalms 51, it begins like this. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, block out my transgressions. There is an incredible depth of poetry here. And maybe we could go to the popular psalm, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This poetic feeling, this poetic writing is present in most of the psalms. But there is one psalm from my perspective. There is one psalm from a poetic point of view that stands above the rest. Which psalm is this? It is, for me, it is Psalms 119. Now, many of you may know Psalms 119 as that really long psalm. But I would argue that it is the most poetic of the Psalms. Now, why would I say that? Well, I need you to stay with me in order to explain why I would say that. Now, Psalms, the book of Psalms was written in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. The English alphabet, 26, but the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Now, Psalms 119, that really long psalm, it has 176 verses, which are divided into 22 stanzas, stanzas, 22 sections, one stanza for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In short, David, he wrote 22 short poems in alphabetical order. So while we are there saying, teaching our children, A is for apple, B is for ball, C is for cat, David was writing poetry. And each verse of, the, of the, each poem starts with a, a different letter of the alphabet. So if he was beginning with the letter A in the English language, he would have written something like, all who are walking in your ways are blessed, who keep your laws do confess, that you are Lord, that you are King, eternal joy this knowledge will bring. Then he would go on to the letter B and then the letter C. Now, although it was the first letter of each of the letters of the alphabet, although that is how it was written, it was much more textured and much more meaningful than this. 
he, David wrote what is known as an alphabetic acrostic poem. So David, he wrote this poem based on the alphabet in alphabetical order. And there is a, a tradition that David used this particular psalm to teach his young son Solomon the alphabet. But not just the alphabet in terms of writing the letters of the alphabet, but the alphabet of the spiritual life. Now there is so much to share from this particular psalm, but today I would like to take you to the letter Hef and look how David experienced excitement about an event that we ourselves may not be excited about. about. So let me take you to the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Hef or H in Psalms 190. It was read for our a scripture reading, verses 57 to 64. In verse 57, it says, you are my portion, O Lord. And this means you are my share, you are my interest. So this verse could actually be translated, Lord, I'm really interested in you. I have said that I will do what you ask of me. In verse 58, its translation could be something like this. I earnestly ask the favor of your face with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. So here David is asking for God's mercy. He wants to experience the grace of God. Verses 59 and 60. I thought about my ways and then I turned my feet to the things that I want, that God wants me to do. And that is to keep the commandments. In other words, he's saying, I've thought about what I have done. And your mercy led me to want to do what you are asking me to do. Your mercy leads me to do what you are asking me to do. In other words, David knows that God's mercy comes first. God, David knows that God acts first. God's mercy influences, God's mercy causes David to be obedient to, who, to him. Well, it causes him to be obedient to God as far as he could be obedient. Now, why do I say this? Because in verse 61, it says, I am still bound by wickedness. Although you have provided mercy, I am still bound by wickedness. He's tied up by wickedness. Wickedness seems to have control. He's aware that God is being merciful, even though David recognized wickedness is still a part of his experience. Verse 61, talk, David talks about how he knows God's law. He, know, he recognizes that what God is asking him to do is important, even though he fails. And if I fail, your mercy is still available. Verse 62, at midnight, I will rise and give thanks to you for your righteous judgments. David is saying here that I am grateful that you judge. I am grateful for your judgment. David has a joy that is associated with judgment. There is mercy for the whole world. It, it really concludes in verse 64. So verses 58 to 61 is about how God's mercy causes David to want to obey God, even though sin seems to have won. And he is trying to share that mercy is available for everyone. Just imagine the congregation singing this and it becoming more and more ingrained in their mind. Mercy is available for everyone. David knew this and he wanted others to know this too. Do we sometimes think that sin has won in our lives? Perhaps we do. Maybe we think that what we have done is more than what God can forgive. But we need to remember that God's mercy is bigger than any sin. We can still go to him and ask him for forgiveness, no matter what we have done, because as it said in verse 64, the earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. 
The earth is full of your mercy. But I just want to take a look at verse 62. Verse 62, let me read it. At midnight, I will rise up to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. What is David saying here? Well, in essence, he is saying, I rise up when it's not convenient for me to rise up to thank you because your judgments are righteous. I don't know about you, but has there been an exciting time in your life that has caused you to get up in the middle of the night because, oh, you are just so excited to do something, to go somewhere, to receive something. This is, what it, this is how it is written in this particular part of the, the Bible, that David is excited about something. David feels joy because of something. And David seems to be grateful for and looking forward to judgment. David thanks God for his judgment. And you know, when you thank someone for something, you're not usually afraid of what you are going to get. You know, a couple of years ago, I saw a picture, it was on Facebook, that would strike fear into the hearts of many, including myself. There was a picture on Facebook, one of my friend's wives, and they were there in the middle of this picture and they had something in their hand. Do you know what was in her hand? It was a tarantula. How many of us like spiders? I don't think too many of us are going to put our hands up to say that we do. Many of us do not like spiders. I am one of those individuals. But I saw this person with a spider on their hand and there this person was smiling away. Now, if I just imagine myself in that particular place and there was a big spider on my hand, first of all, I would not be smiling. And secondly, I would be waiting for somebody to take that spider from my hand. And when they did, I would want to thank that person for taking away this scary thing from me. I would want to thank that person because the fear that would be in my heart would now be gone. I would be saying thank you because my fear is released. In this Psalm, David is thankful to God because there is no fear in judgment. David recognized there is no fear in judgment. In fact, the psalmist here is telling us that judgment is something to be grateful for. He recognizes that there is joy in judgment. This psalm, this hymn, was stating that those who are walking with God should not be afraid of judgment. In fact, it is saying more than that. It's saying that we should be thanking God for judgment. This hymn, this song of worship, this hymn which would be sung in congregations was saying there is joy in judgment. But I ask myself the question, would we sing this hymn? Do we want God to judge us? Maybe not. Why is that? I would say it's because when judgment is mentioned today, people are usually afraid. Just because of the, the connotations that it has in their mind. People usually feel and think of judgment as a negative thing. David was excited for it. But in many cases, we are not excited for it. Some of the things that we should be excited by, we actually dread. For centuries, the word judgment has struck fear into the hearts of God's people. We have an unfriendly picture of judgment. And as a result, people, including maybe some of us, are frightened by God and perceive nothing favorable in God's judgment. Because according to the popular understanding of judgment, to judge means to condemn, it means to punish, it means to destroy. And when we or other people equate God's judgment only with condemnation, 
When we associate it only with punishment and destruction, we cannot experience the joy in judgment. Because what we think is, how is God going to condemn and punish me? What can I do to prevent his judgment from falling on me? And then we get to thinking, how, how much do I need to do to prevent it? Have I done enough to prevent God judging me? And then when we get this perspective, we start to try and earn our way into God's good graces. If that is one thing that we do, or otherwise we just run away from this thing that we call judgment. We live in fear of judgment. But for biblical authors, the divine judgment is consistently seen as something that is desired. It is consistently seen as something that they look forward to. And maybe it's because they see something which we do not readily see. There is something that we often forget or have never connected. And it is this fact that judgment and mercy go hand in hand. Like we like mercy. We like it when people are merciful to us. It means that people are going to do something, something good for us. Or maybe we have done something to someone else which is bad and they say we are not going to retaliate. And we like mercy when it comes to, to God because it means that God is going to do something nice for us. It means that we are going to get something that we don't deserve. It means that God will give us eternal life. But judgment, we don't like. However, it seems that the biblical writers had something at the forefront of their minds that we do not. They knew this. They knew that God's judgment meant that things are going to get better. In fact, God's judgment is the place that his mercy can be fully shown. It can be shown with the reward of eternal life, with no pain or crying because these things have passed away. You see, without judgment, God's mercy can't be shown. In short, God's judgment means that he is going to save you. He wants to save you. When we start looking at it like that, it starts to put a positive spin on what judgment is. Because judgment means that things are going to be put right. It means that those who trust him will be okay. Not the seemingly good, not those who know the most, but those who trust him. Because if you trust in God, when he judges you, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you want. In judgment, when we trust in God, we don't get what we deserve, we get what we want. To help us to understand, to help us to understand this, this thought about judgment, we can look at the book of Judges. Question, what was the primary function of the judges in the book of Judges? Was it to condemn, to punish or to destroy God's people? If we go back and we read through the book of Judges, we see that when the people cried to God for help, judges were sent by God to deliver his people from oppression, from devastation, and from their enemies. The judges were called to care, protect, and deliver God's people from their enemies when they asked for it. And this was a, 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 this was a telescope, this was a, a microscope into what God wants to do with his judgment. Because judgment isn't about destroying primarily, what judgment is about is about God being passionate enough to want to rescue his people. You see, judgment is God's passionate way of rescuing his people. Are we afraid when somebody rescues us? We tend not to be, and this is what God wants us to see in his judgment. He wants us to know, he wants us to see, he wants us to understand that judgment is his way of making things 
better. Judgment is God showing us what mercy, which includes eternal life with him and no suffering, looks like. It is God showing us what mercy looks like. You see, if we trust God, in judgment, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we want. And ironically, or maybe fantastically, this is the same thing that God wants because he wants to give you a positive judgment. He wants to rescue you. He wants to make things better for you. And he's saying, is this what you want? Because I want to give it to you. You may not deserve it, but if you want it, you can have it. And David, in this particular psalm, he recognized that he was bound by sin, but it's something that he wanted. He wanted God to judge because he knew that when God judged, things were going to get better. No wonder people in the Bible wanted judgment to come. People wanted judgment because they knew that God wanted to give them good things and things were going to get better because mercy fills the earth. Now, I've said this. But there still remains a question. What difference will all of this make to me today? Why does it even matter how I feel about judgment? Well, I'll put forward two reasons why how we feel about judgment is important. So let me set the scene. You meet a person, and as you meet and engage with this person, you recognize this person is scary and you're scared of this person. And you meet them again and again. And every time you meet them, you, you recognize there is something very scary and very frightening about this person. One day, this person comes up to you and they say, would you like to come to my house for lunch? Would you want to go? Let me be honest, going wouldn't be the first thing that I would want to do. Would you recommend that anyone else goes to lunch with this person? Again, I, I, I put it to you, many of you would say no. You see, it is similar with God. We can't really witness it or we can't really share positively about a loving God if we're scared of what he does, if we're scared of his judgment. Having the wrong picture of judgment affects the picture of God that we share. Is he loving or is he someone to be scared of? In Psalms 29 verse 11, it says that God wants to give us peace. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, God wants us to have peace. The fruits of the spirit. He wants peace is one of those fruit or one of the, it's part of the, the encompassing love and it's one of the consequences of love, peace. How can you consider that you can have peace today? when you are worried about everything that you do. How can we have peace today when we think the things that we are going to do or the things that we do may lead to destruction tomorrow? You see, God wants us to have peace. And he wants us to know that if we trust him, if we believe in him, he will judge in your favor, no matter our background, no matter what we have done. He says, it doesn't matter what you have done if you trust me, because I will be able to save you no matter what. Because judgment is not based on what you have done, and I recognize I need to be careful when I say this. But judgment, judgment is not based on what we have done. Because if, we, if it was based on what we had done, all of us would deserve death which is simply a consequence of being separated from God. However, God's judgment, God's judgment is based on what Jesus has done on our behalf. He lived the perfect life for us. And he died and rose again so that we have the opportunity for life. 
And if we accept this by faith and get to know him, if we trust him, he will take us through the judgment and give us eternal life. As the psalm says, the earth is filled with his mercy. The question is, do we want mercy? Do we want life? One more thing that I'll share. We may say, I keep sinning. How can he save me? But David says in Psalms 119, 61, the cords of wickedness have bound me, but I have not dis disregarded your law. And then in verse 62, he thanks God for his judgment. So David recognizes that even though he is a sinner, he is thankful for God's judgment because mercy is available for him. This means that even though we are bad, even though we are sinful, there is help for us in God's judgment. So I say to you, go to God and he will help. Go to God and he will say that you are righteous. Get to know him and spend time with him and perhaps slowly your life will begin to change. You see, we become like the five people we spend the most time with. So spend time with him and make him one of those five friends that we spend the most time with. And the change may begin to commence. You see, when we understand these things, when we understand the truth about judgment, maybe we can experience the Psalms like David did and say, at midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. You know, to conclude, we recognize that there can be joy in judgment because judgment is good. Judgment is God's way of showing his mercy. If we have a, 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 an incorrect perspective of judgment, it means that we communicate the face of God in the wrong way. It means that we communicate a picture of God that is incorrect because God wants us to have peace. He wants us to have that peace that passes all understanding. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this is, judgment is not about what we do, but it is about what Jesus has done for us. Therefore, we can say, judgment, in judgment, we don't get what we deserve, we get what we want. Do you want to be with Jesus? There was a judge who brought his own son before him because he'd committed a crime. Now this judge, he felt a deep grief that his son would violate all of these laws which he had based his entire life upon. Tears welled up in his eyes as he listened to the evidence against his son. The courtroom was sat in silence, wondering how the judge would rule. The son was obviously guilty. So what would the judge do? Would he just give the son a reprimand in an act of mercy? Or would he give him the minimum pen penalty for the offense? There was silence in the courtroom as the judge gave his judgment. Much to the surprise and to the gasps of the people who were in the courtroom, the judge handed down the maximum fine to his son. In doing so, he, he upheld the law to its fullest degree. Now the son, the son was in shock because he knew that he couldn't pay the fine and in his mind, he thought he was going to go to prison and this brought him anguish. He looked up at his father with huge eyes in disbelief. But then something happened that nobody expected. The father, he stepped down from the bench and he took off his judge's robes. He went to his son and told his son how much he loved him. And then out of his own pocket, he took his checkbook and wrote a check for the amount that the son now had to pay. He tore the check and 
handed it to his son and said, son, do you want this? Son, do you want this? Do you want this? The son with tears in his eyes accepted the check and said, yes, father, yes, father, yes. As a judge, this father showed his commitment to honor the law to its fullest. But then he stepped down from the seat of honor and showed his love for his child. His son never understood the depth of his father's commitment to the law until that moment. And also until that moment, he never knew the depth of his father's love for him. He felt a deep sorrow for the pain that he had caused his father and also for the pain that he had caused for people that he had hurt by his crime. With his head bowed and tears flowing freely, he asked for his forgiveness, which the father willingly gave to him. Because of what the father did for the son, the son went on to commit no more crime. And in fact, he, he went on to share with other people this act of mercy that his father had shown him. In some ways, this story is like our story. The son deserved punishment for what he had done, but he was saved from punishment by what the judge did for him. All he had to do was take the check if he wanted it. In God's judgment, you don't get what you deserve, but you get what you want. David knew, knew this. He knew that we're not saved by what we do, but by what Jesus has done for us, because judgment gives God an opportunity to show his mercy. God has written a check for our freedom from, from the negative judgment. The question is, will you accept it? The question is, will you accept what Jesus has done for you? If you believe that Jesus has died and rose again in order that you are able to have life eternal with him, then you will take the check because you know that there is nothing to worry about because forgiveness is there for you. So there can be joy in judgment. And no, this is not a license to sin, but even if we do, there is forgiveness for all of us. There can be true joy in judgment. There can be true joy in judgment. Who would like to have joy in judgment? I pray that you do, because I know that God wants to give it to you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we recognize who you are. You're a God that wants to save. Even though we are sinners, you want to judge in our faith. You are the one that acts first. You are the one that, that goes first. And we pray that we will recognize this, be grateful for what you have done, and then allow you to affect our lives so that we become more and more like you. Let us remember that in judgment, we don't get what we deserve, but we get what we want. We all deserve death, but if we want to have life eternal with you and a relationship with you, we have no issues with the judgment, no matter where we are on the journey. So let us rely on you. Keep us safe and let us remember these things is my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.